All right. And now I am so excited to introduce our presenters. Um, Cheryl Hiblin is the founder and president of Illuminate Ed Collective, a group of transformative educational consultants who partner with business, nonprofit, higher education, and school districts to support strategic planning and change management in service of equitable outcomes for all. Cheryl spent 20 years in the San Diego Unified School District, where as a principal, she was part of the successful transformation of a large or urban high school into four award-winning small schools. And as an executive director, where she designed efforts to align the district graduation requirements to the UC entry course requirements, expanded the dual enrollment program with colleges and redesigned secondary master schedule mm -hmm. efforts. Dr. Lori Rhodes is currently an associate superintendent with Stanford Public Schools in Connecticut. In her current work as a di district administrator, she focuses on family and community engagement, innovative educational opportunities to provide access and opportunity for each student, principal supervision and support, and student discipline. Prior to this, Lori was an assistant professor of educational leadership, a secondary school site administrator, and founding principal of a charter high school and a bilingual Spanish teacher. Um, and Cheryl and Lori are the co-authors of Equitable School Scheduling, which they'll be giving us a sneak peek of today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl and Lori. Thank you, Melissa. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Melissa said, I'm Cheryl, and I'm really excited to be here. This is one of my favorite topics, so I'm hoping that everyone that's here with us uh, likes to geek out a little bit on scheduling. <laughs> Um, I will second that. Cheryl and I met geeking out on schedules. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm coming from Stanford, Connecticut, and um, I also want to thank Corwin for their support throughout this entire process and for hosting this webinar. So before we get started, we were hoping to find out a little bit about your school or district context by asking you to respond to the following prompt in the chat. When you think about building schedules that support equitable outcomes, what are some of the challenges you encounter or anticipate? So just take a second. It can be a one word answer. Yeah, time, resources, right? Yep. Bell oh. schedule, staffing. <laughs> yep. Shared staff. Okay. Class size prerequisite. Yep. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. Balance and staffing. Staffing. Mm -hmm. Lack of flexibility. That's yep. that jumps out. Admin being inflexible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Shared space. Okay. So lots of different types of environments, too, based on some of the answers. Mm -hmm. Not enough space. Staffing. Yep. Okay, well, you know what, uh, Lori, I think that many of the things that are in the chat are actually a lot of things that we grappled with as well. Um, so keep adding these things in here. I'd like to, as we move through, um, keep taking a look at what's coming up and we'll make some connections to some of the things that you've dropped in. So our outcomes for today um, are for us to understand the scheduling theory of action and what we call the architects of equity. To, under, to identify the differences between traditional logistical scheduling and intentionally strategic scheduling and its impacts on outcomes, and to examine the changing practices that these architects of equity um, must put in place uh, to change outcomes for students uh, as best we can through scheduling. So our why behind writing this book was really grounded in the realization that equitable scheduling is not just something that we were grappling with in our local context. It's a national issue, and we can see that in the chat, too. It's probably an international issue. I've worked in over 20 states in the last four years, and I believe scheduling issues in our country are not primarily technical in nature. Many people know how to build schedules and put butts in seats. But in many places, it's the adaptive skills that are the barrier to building schedules that change kids' lives. To kind of illustrate this further, if you consider Margaret Wheatley's six circle model on the right, 
It illustrates the balance needed between adaptive and technical skills. And in scheduling, the technical skills are things like building sections, common preps, adding an advisory, changing a bell schedule. But the below the line skills are anticipating and planning for how the technical changes will impact people's identities within the schedule, their relationships to others in the schedule, and the type of misinformation that might surface if there's not good communication throughout the scheduling process. So to restate, the problem isn't that sites don't have scheduling expertise. It is that despite this expertise, the outcomes for student groups continue to be inequitable in many contexts. As former high school principals, our stance around scheduling is reflected in the triangle on this slide. Our belief is that school principals have the challenging role of ensuring that structure, instruction, and culture are live balanced within the school. Too often, districts focus on making instructional shifts without considering the structures needed to support students, staff, and content inside these efforts. Or districts will shift all their focus to building culture first, which we believe is actually the byproduct of using structures to support instructional changes that change kids' post-secondary options. So to restate, our belief is that when school leaders build schedules that protect instructional strategies, that allow for students, teachers, and content to interact in meaningful ways, the result is a school culture where all students see themselves having a post-secondary future. And what this means is that the role of the school principal and his or her supervisor is a critical relationship in achieving equitable outcomes. So why does any of this matter? Because schools across the nation are part of a leaky pipeline to graduation, a pipeline that starts with a diverse group of students and ends with inequitable post-secondary outcomes. The leaks in this pipeline happen at critical points. We know that research supports the fact that students who are not achieving by grade level at, in grades three or four are not likely to graduate on time and or meet meaningful graduation outcomes that lead to post-secondary success. As these students progress across the leaky pipeline, many become the students with disciplinary or attendance issues, which perpetuates this outcome further. In this book, we make the case that it's not just the academic outcomes that need to, dis that need to change to disrupt this pipeline. It's how we use structure to sort students away from excellence when they don't fit the typical student mold. And these decisions, no matter how well-intentioned, result in perpetuating achievement gaps rather than closing them. And the resulting consequences when they enter high school are critical to understand if there's a desire to achieve equitable access, opportunity, and outcomes in schools. We believe that reimagining a tightly structured schedule that prioritizes providing supports to all students is a strategy to avoid what has been described as the leaky pipeline to graduation. And the first step is for schedulers to move from simple logistical schedulers to more strategic schedulers. So to illustrate what we mean by logistical versus strategic, a logistical scheduler builds the schedule alone. A strategic one builds it with a team. Logistical scheduling's goal is to protect the prior year teaching lines. A strategic scheduling goal is to align the current resources you've been given around data to enact a 10 month plan for change. Logistical scheduling uh, enrollment projections are used to identify teachers and courses. In a strategic approach, enrollment projections are used to create a frame that's going to lead to desired outcomes. In logistical scheduling, course tallies are used to build sections. In strategic scheduling, course tallies are verified and used to construct equitable patterns in the frame. And finally, in logistical scheduling, students and families are passive, and in strategic scheduling, they're participants. 
So take a moment to think about your own context. Are most of your processes logistical or strategic? And does your current schedule produce equitable outcomes? So this is a moment for you to take a, a quick poll. Carol, while um, folks are working on the poll, um, which I think needs to launch, I don't, are people seeing a poll on their end? I don't see a poll yet. Oh, here it is. Uh, <laughs> while folks are working on the poll, I just had a question about whether you'd be willing to share your, these slides with participants after the webinar. Absolutely. Okay, so we will include the slide deck in the email that we send to um, all attendees. Okay, so we do have some sites and places that are strategic, but for the most part, it looks like uh, we've got, you know, a, a logistical. Does your current schedule produce? Okay, yep, hmm. yep. Those percents are lining up. Okay, a couple more seconds. All right, do we wanna share results? Okay, so it looks like 70% of the participants said that most of the processes are logistical and 30% strategic. That's great though, that we have you know a good chunk that are already making that shift. Mm -hmm. Does your current schedule produce equitable outcomes? Yes for the for seven and no for um for 76 percent. Okay. Yeah, not surprising. This is what we see um, nationally. Um so uh Lori, I'm gonna hand off to you and let you talk to them about our scheduling theory of action. Great. Okay. Because asking site teams to move from logistical to strategic scheduling is really an act of shifting the team mindset away from a simply balancing butts and seats approach to a complicated and layered scheduling process that may require getting clear about priorities, one question we attempt to answer in this book is, how does a shift in scheduling team mindsets result in scheduling practices that produce equitable student outcomes? To answer this question, the theory of action that sits as the roadmap for our book is grounded in the belief that if scheduling team mindsets shift, scheduling teams will change their scheduling practices and the result will be the desired student outcomes. To name this shift, we call scheduling teams that live within this theory of action the architects of equity. As we introduce the concept of the architects of equity, I want to caution us not to see this concept as a simple shift to building a scheduling team. While I'm going to illustrate a model idea, the concept is not about a certain number of people or just simply collaborating. These teams have much deeper work to do, and it is grounded in their ability to shift their mindsets and significantly change their own scheduling practices. Too often, the scheduling process happens in silos and we end up with a schedule that defaults to the status quo. This is a schedule that is solved as if it is a math problem and not something with the potential to support and drive student access and success. In this scenario, one administrator or counselor is tasked with taking the course requests and turning that into the initial framework for the schedule. After that, they hand off sections to department heads who fill in their teacher's lines. Considering all the departments and specialized programming in large comprehensive high schools, this can be a process that happens in isolation without collaboration. And if it does occur this way, which is so segmented, it's difficult to make connections across the entire schedule to see what teachers and sections are truly needed to run an effective and strategic schedule. Because of this practice that we have so often seen, we suggest creating a scheduling team that is focused on equitable, collaborative, and strategic process. This is a team that does not stop working. There is no handing off of responsibilities. This is a team that works together to innovate and never delegates their role. In our practice, this team has four distinct roles, but not necessarily four people, and we will explain. By adhering to an equitable process that is student-centered throughout, this team becomes known as the architects of equity. So now let's get on to the four roles on the team. Architects of equity do not work in isolation. These four distinct roles create accountability, collaboration, and balance, 
so that the best schedule can be created for your school. Scheduling is a highly collaborative and interactive process between members of the scheduling team, as well as with internal and external stakeholders. It's an iterative and fluid process that includes new ideas, revisions, and epiphanies. I'm gonna go through the roles. Again, this is not necessarily meaning one person for each role. So one role is the visionary. Often this might be the school leader, but the visionary communicates how fiscal and human resources will be organized as an intentional roadmap for the 10 month change in student outcomes for all, right, the school year. Then there's the role of designer. These can be APs, um, VPs. They collaboratively transform the communicated roadmap from the visionary into a blueprint of course access, which is aligned to resource equity that supports post-secondary success for all students. The third role is the builder. Some places call this the site tech. They build the blueprint in the student information system in your SIS. They know the system well enough to find legal and creative ways to design with equity at the core. And the fourth role are the agents. Sometimes this falls to the counselors. These are the advocates for student access into the equitable core that leads to post-secondary success. Um, as shown in the different roles for the architects of equity, it is critical to internalize the understanding that the creation of the schedule and the assigning of teachers and students should not happen in isolation, should not be farmed out to players only focusing on their small part of the larger schedule. There must be many eyes on the process so that equity and access are ensured for all students. And here's our quote. To achieve scheduling goals focused on equitable outcomes, these four scheduling roles must develop a cadence of team accountability that is grounded in a growth mindset. Okay, we're gonna pause for another poll. So I'll let you um, read the poll, we'll get that set up. I don't know if it's open yet, but as you consider the idea of a scheduling team shifting its practices to become architects of equity, reflect on your own schools and districts. There we see the results, okay. Yeah, the first question is how many people at each site in your district are currently collaborating to design and implement your current schedule? Mm -hmm. And in some places we do see just one person and that's quite a task, right? And you can really get buried in your own details then. And, you know, I was, what's that? Lose sight of the forest for the trees or how that goes. But we're seeing a lot of it congregated at the just one or two people, you know, just a few up at the higher number of four or five. Okay. Looks a little bit like 50-50 around a, a growth mindset approach to scheduling. Mm. All right, Cheryl's gonna share the first step in shifting mindsets in order to move your teams to um, scheduling teams to architects of equity. So one of the questions that we um, wanted to answer in this book is how do the scheduling teams move from agents of compliance to architects of equity? And um, once principals have identified the architects of equity, it's essential that work is done to ha help this team hold each other accountable to these shifting mindsets. So in the book, we talk about the first exercise is confronting the status quo. And there are um, three parts of the status of confronting the status quo, questioning long held assumptions, uncovering personal barriers and owning team discomfort. And there are a number of um, exercises and tools that you can use to bring scheduling teams through a process where they're doing that. The second exercise that we highlight in the book is called getting your team's mindset. And that includes shifting their mindsets towards supporting rather than sorting, engaging collaboratively rather than in silos, and transforming strategically, not just logistically. And again, we take them through in the book um, different things that they can do to calibrate and hold each other accountable to this. 
And I would just say that that the theory of action that we were taking you through and the um, quo and mindset, the, this is all the setup in chapters one and two before we actually shift into some of the technical and logistical and strategic work that you guys were originally putting in the chat. We really believe based on what we've seen that if people don't do this work first, it's really hard to influence um, the kind of change we want to see in the rest of the work. And then finally, I'll bring it, I'll bring you back to the Margaret Wheatley circle that in addition to confronting the status quo and getting their mindset, they have to make a commitment to work above and below the green line simultaneously. So once the architects of equity confront the status quo, get their mindset, the teams have to deliberately practice tending to the technical changes at the same time they're dealing with the adaptive changes or meaningful change will not occur. Making technical changes to schedules, scheduling or bell schedules without considering and planning for the adaptive changes will absolutely kill equity efforts before they begin. And the architects of equity must be developed to understand and act on this. Okay, one more poll question, everyone. Or, uh, so are your schedulers comfortable working on the technical and adaptive aspects of scheduling? Both. Okay. Interesting. Okay. A lot more are. That's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, Lori is going to take us through um, some of the changing practices. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the resources that you'll be able to find in the book, the tangible resources. Um, once the So as Cheryl mentioned, that we've just given you the setup of the first two chapters. And once the architects of equity have worked to shift their scheduling mindset and challenge the status quo, they must change six distinct practices as a team. This must be done to create a schedule that is student-centered and provides access and opportunity for all. And each of the following practices has its own chapter in our book. And I'll start with practice one. Changing practice one is know the system to change the system. And this chapter includes resources such as equity, um, equity assessment tools and scheduling expectation models. Changing practice two is designing core sequences that impact equity. And some resources that you may find here are tools for designing what we designate as the equitable core, which are the high level graduation requirements that students need to um, for them in order to have some post-secondary success. Changing practice three is prioritize the historically marginalized. And here you'll see tools for shifting schedule mindsets from a deficit model to a growth model. We talk about English learner special education students. Changing practice four is designated as organized strategically and intentionally. And so here you'll find common planning tools, pathway design tools, and student cohorting tools. For changing practice five, understand how to use resources strategically. This is more of our financial chapter, our re you know, about human resources. You'll find Bell Schedule Impact Calculator, a vacant seat analysis tool, teacher allocation model, and course selection process tools. And for changing practice six, structure your time and input intentionally. And this is where we provide a scheduling timeline builder and various scheduling role timelines, for example, for the counselor, for the builder, for the visionary, things like that. And I'll also mention that each chapter ends with reflective questions that you can use. So if you're reading this as a group, if you're working through it, we've also provided reflective questions. Cheryl's going to share the process of improving outcomes with a concrete example common to many schools. 
Yeah. And before I make that shift, I just mm -hmm. wanted to, I saw in the chat, there were a couple of middle school folks that were asking about, you know, one of the shifts that their school wants to make is to give the honor students more electives. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things in the book that we will um, talk about is, you know, what is the set of courses that any student should have access to? So if electives are important, how do we build schedules where whether I'm an honor student or a student that needs more support, what kind of structures can we put in place so some kids aren't getting more electives and other kids are? Mm -hmm. So um, so that's definitely something that we'll grapple with in the book in chapter three in the Equitable Core. Um, in terms of elementary school, um, this book is primarily geared towards um, K-8 middle and, and high school. But I do think that schedulers in elementary, because of some of the ways that people will organize elementaries, your, your six and a half hour lesson map, there's an equitable way to kind of like create some of those schedules and the way sometimes schools lottery kids into um, teacher schedules. There's some usefulness, um, but the book is primarily um, geared towards the secondary grades. Okay, and the the third part of our uh, theory of action, we talked about shifting mindsets, changing practices, and the changing practices is really where the meat of scheduling comes in. But the last part of it is is changing outcomes. So I'm just going to use one example from um, uh, from chapter three in our book on equity assessments. And one of the the things that schools do is they know the system to change the system. And so there are a number of assessments in that um, chapter that will allow you to look at data through a student group lens so that you can be really particular about identifying levers that are actually going to change outcomes. And so we believe that when you know the system, you can change it. So when you identify data points and you identify levers that actually will move multiple data points, you're really getting your intentions, your actions, and your outcomes set better. And the architects of equity have to know how to align intentions, actions, and outcomes. So just to clarify what we mean by intentions, actions, and outcomes, intentions are what we want to improve, actions are what we do to improve them, and outcomes are what, re what are the results of our actions. So just as an example, I'll give you a danger of misalignment. So the intention at this school was that their data revealed that many students of color didn't have access to advanced study courses and didn't earn weighted credits. So their action was, they built more sections of AP and they used a growth mindset criteria to identify more students of color to put in them. So um, they, they did that. And then their outcome was the enrollment of students in their AP classes increased overall, but they saw a decline in the number of students tested and the number of students passing AP tests. So What's really important here is this is an illustration of the misalignment between intention, action, and outcome. If access had only had been the only desired result, this would have worked. But, um, but if you want to, quote, earn desired weighted credits, this wouldn't simply be met by enrolling more kids in advanced studies for the first time there would need to be actions associated with things like identifying teachers who had success with these students to teach the sections, providing mandatory co-requisite, not, not intervention courses or the presumption of failure, but co-requisite courses that the core teacher teaches alongside the core class to ensure first-time success in the class and designing and monitoring a schedule with the teacher to ensure first-time success. All of these things would have to be considered if you're building a system of equity. And once we use equity assessments to help us identify intention, action, and desired outcomes, we have to codify 
those expectations into something tangible. So one of the things that we share in the book is the development of scheduling expectations. So if you're a district office person, these would be expectations across the system for every school. Or if you're a building uh, principal, these would be expectations for your site. But you codify these expectations because you have to measure them along the way. Too often we build schedules and then we wait for standardized tests to see how we did all year. We can't do that as the architects of equity. We have to have something tangible to monitor and do. And if those things don't work, we have to course correct. The other part that we'll talk about in the book is um, once you do an assessment of your data, set your intentions, actions, and outcomes, codify your scheduling expectations, architects of equity inspect what they expect. And the types of data that we look at if we're truly trying to build an equity lens have to be through the student group lens and have to be viewed from multiple angles. So in this example here, we're looking at the success rates of AP and IB. So something that I would wanna know is, what are those rates by student group, by classroom, by course, and by school? How many students are actually taking the test by student group, by classroom, course, and school? How many students are actually passing the test by classroom, course, and school? And if there aren't a diverse a number of kids in these classes that mirror the diversity of the school, there has to be a course correction, both in the way we build our schedules, the way we provide access in our schedules, and the way we support kids in them. And then finally, if you're looking through a lens of equitable equity between college AP and IB, you've got to look for sure between the student group enrollment in each of these groups by course and the student group enrollment in each of these things by school. And then are they earning a C or higher, which we know is the minimum of what we need to meet those high-level post-secondary transfer expectations? And are they actually earning transferable college credit by student group? So the book will also talk about you know, the role that the architects of equity have in, um, in inspecting these really important outcomes. Um, so we are going to give you one more poll. I promise this will be the last one. In your context, our conversations about um, intentions, actions, and outcomes happening in the same space as scheduling. And while we're waiting for the answer to that poll, I'm going to answer um, uh, Ms. Austin's question, does the book talk about strategically using educators for specific subjects in terms of their relationships? So um, you in the book, you will see that we will talk about the fact that um, having the right fit for some of these students who have never taken an AP course before is going to be a critical thing to do. I'll just share with you that in my work in San Diego Unified, we actually did an equity assessment on the areas that I just shared on the previous slides. And in certain schools, I could literally see educators with outcomes that had produced amazing outcomes in regular coursework with some of the, I think the class was American literature. And we actually drove to the school and sat with the principal and teacher and said, would you consider taking on an AP section of American Lit? And uh, the teachers, you know, many of them said yes. And we saw much better outcomes because different strategies were used in the context of delivering the curriculum. Okay. Uh, so it looks like, um, it's almost half and half conversations about actions and outcomes. That's great. That is great. That, I mean, to me, that means that some of the schools, you know, it's, I just keep thinking about it. Like, don't think about the master schedule as just a math problem, you know, and that we just get to the end and it's, or like a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And you just put that last piece in, which is the last kid with their full schedule and, you know, wipe your, you know, brush off your hands and we can now attack the year. It's so important to really understand um, how to dig into it, how to be intentional with what you're doing. 
Okay, I think we'll, we can share the results of that um, poll. Yep. And you know what, this actually, you know, we, we went through and we wanted to leave time for more questions. If there are things that come up with this is a quote from, you know, we use it in the book, we're going to say it here. The secret of getting ahead is getting started. And um, we just want to thank everyone for joining us. It's been such a pleasure to present this labor of love to you. Um, we are extremely passionate about the schedule, but what drives that passion is this as we laid out at the beginning, is this deep understanding that the potential that the schedule has to form the structures to create equitable opportunities for all students. Um, scheduling, you know, the schedule is not a magic wand. That is not, you know, the point. It's not saying that there's a perfect schedule, but we must create the structures within which the teachers, students, and content can live and, you know, to best maximize the relationship between the instructional core. And that's why we start where we start. So, you know, again, thank you for being here. Um, and we'll just, we'll take a look at the chat and see if there's anything that we can address. I do think a lot of the questions um, that they asked in the beginning were what I would call like in the weeds, like the balancing of a schedule, the resourcing of a schedule. And all of that is in chapters three through eight, which are changing practices. So that's when we really get in the weeds about bell schedules and mm -hmm. um, different types of master schedules and um, the types of equitable course sequences that we've seen work um, in schools. Uh, might the book be helpful for a small school of 115 students, limited space classrooms, and a limited number of faculty? So, uh, Donna, I think um, if the if the if the purpose of of reading the book is to deal with some of let's say the facility issues, I'm not sure that that is specific to. Um, to, you know, what is in the chapters, but if it is, but if the goal is to talk about how uh, teachers might team or, or, or bell schedules might be used differently to maximize time and space, then I would say yes. For any um, questions just about um, a particular issue that you're grappling with, and we can tell you if there's potentially something that might support you. Smaller schools are actually harder to build schedules around and the cohorting process of building a smaller school is it has to be far more intentional sometimes than the large mammoth schools. Right, because the schedule is so constricting. I mean, you know, if you can't offer and sort of depending where you are in the country too, right? Like class sizes we found have really varied, right, contractually across the country. And some people have more flexibility. Some people have a lot less flexibility in terms of how they need to fill their schedules. But I think, you know, that's part of the point that we make, right, Cheryl, is like, this isn't a book about the that technical, logistical, like this is the strategic way of thinking about your schedule. Yeah, so Donna just at, uh, said, I'm excited to learn if your book provides guidance in a school with very new leadership and relatively high turnover, people who know, understand the school. Yeah, um, I will I will tell you that um, if you, so 20 years ago, when I was first a, a principal, um, no one gives you a manual to learn to be a principal. You're kind of learning on the job. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I would have appreciated with a book like this is I was very good as a principal at the processing and the tasks and the getting things done and checking things off my list. But the human factor is so much more difficult to deal with. Unions, um, pressures about who teaches which subjects, uh, parents being upset if an elective, uh, you know, leaves the school. And, and what this will do is give leaders, both at the district and site level, tools to be able to say, okay, I understand, like, here are the processes that we're putting in place for input, but ultimately, here here's the line that, that we won't cross to compromise equity. Mm -hmm. And I would have appreciated that um, as a young first-year principal.
I meant who don't understand, <laughs> who don't understand this goal. Well, what better way to get people to have buy-in? Like when you have high turnover, what better way to have people understand the school than to have the school leader act as the visionary on the architects of equity and mm -hmm. take these new people through a very open, transparent, communicative um, schedule building process? I mean, the math, the schedule is the the visionary's um, philosophy, right? I mean, you can dig into a schedule and see where where the values are held. You can you can read between the lines in terms of what sections are offered. Um, I'm I'm looking through schedules, and an, an example might be if our algebra two classes average. 28, 29 students and our PE health classes are averaging 22, 23 students. That's a reflection on me in terms of where I put my values as the leader for my class size, right? I'm, I'm okay with big math classes and I'm okay with smaller PE health. Now, as a leader, I would want to reverse those numbers. Those are my values. That's, you know, these they reflect those core values of how you see your school and where you see it's going. A lot of the um, young principals that I've supported in states like New York, um, it's not that they don't know how to build a master schedule. It is that they really don't know how to navigate all of the um, what's coming at them when they have to make really difficult decisions about priorities in the schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know, and it's different. It, it, your your own context is is different. I'm in California. We, you know, the the schedules that I see in Lori's district and and in New York, these <laughs> nine period schedules, like that's not that's not our jam. Like we don't see that a lot out here. But then you see lots of four by fours, right? Like mm -hmm. in different places. So not only do you have to have some scheduling chops, but you have to work in your own context. We, we, we talk about class size all the time. Mike just said, what if specialized magnet programs are decided by a district to place at schools like Cambridge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, Mike. So, um, <laughs> so um, you know, I'm going to lean on, um, on a Stanford professor to answer this question. <laughs> um so Linda Darling Hammond, um, you know, talks all the time about the fact that, you know, building, building like almost pathways around a program can be, you know, pretty, uh, you know, inequitable depending upon what happens. It also, you know, we don't have, um, like I, IB programs out here on the, on the West coast, Sometimes people will open these IB programs and they can only get like 17 kids in each section at every grade level. And so all the sections of regular courses and other courses are like at 36 mm -hmm. and the IB courses are all at 17 and then they get 20 specialty electives. So unraveling some of what district offices sort of like allow or help you structure. That's why these conversations can't just happen at the site level. Like this has to happen system wide if you truly want um, there to be equity. What I tell the schools that I work in is that if pre APIB is good enough for one group of kids, it's good enough for all kids. So I know in North Kansas City and in uh, Mesa, Arizona, They've started doing things like instead of kids taking bio, everybody takes um, middle years bio mm. um, so that they all have access to pre AP. And then the kids that might have some challenges in that, they just are building not interventions, um, but but um, co-requisites so that they so that they pass them. You know, I'm just going to chime in, Cheryl, because we're talking about our scheduling and we're doing our own work here in the schools that I'm in. And we did just have this big idea about 
because we're going from seven to eight periods and what that will allow us to do within the schedule. We were talking about the AP, IB, and we call them ECE, which is UConn, University of Connecticut classes, and talking about making like a high level study hall that is specific to um, like study strategies and success in those high level classes that would, you know, then the kids will have that flexibility in the schedule. So when they're taking either AB or IP or ECE, they can opt into a more structured study hall that supports and maybe fills in some gaps. So it doesn't take away from their placement in those classes and it's not after school, right? You know, it's built in and it would be very intentional. We were making it it's, and it wouldn't be a collateral. So, right, this is our philosophy. This is where we put our money where our mouth is. It wouldn't just be a collateral study hall. It would be a point two. We would pay the teacher their section because that's why we want the work to be put into it. So that's our own internal thinking about solving one of these issues. Yeah, the other thing too, this idea of just like putting an IB or or AP program down on a site and miraculously we're going to attract all these families. Mm -hmm. Um you you can do the same thing with a um you can do the same thing with a college program. And the truth is, and at least the data out of my district, kids that were placed in the appropriate dual enrollment courses that they had interest in, that fit with their passions, um, and that were high level, actually did very well. In um, my old high school is Kearney High School in San Diego, and you know, four to eight hundred kids a day go out to the local community college. Um, they they also take AP courses. There are AP courses there, but there are other ways to structure these things and experiences. It doesn't just have to be putting a program down on the ground that will become elite for one group of kids. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do do that, spreading it across um, so that everybody has a chance and is supported to be pre-IB if that's the goal. Yeah. Um, Mike, I think you and I would be fast friends. Intervention time, what's enough? 20 minutes? Uh, no. So, so I can't believe how many schedules we see with these interventions and tiered this and supplemental that. And by the time the kids sit down, they have 10 minutes. You know, I think if you're going to put priorities in a, in a schedule, why not use co-requisites? So if I'm a math teacher and I have a hundred kids on my caseload, but 20 of them need additional support, why can't I have co-requisite sections where I'm using what happened in my math course that day and we're making sure that mastery is happening in that, in that next section so kids aren't behind rather than it being just like jam them in there and give them some intervention and, you know, hope that it helps the, there's got to be more connectivity between the tier one environment and what we do in interventions. I hate that word. So co-requisites, but. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Monica, did you just join us or did you have a question? Oh, exactly, Mike. I'm a big fan of structures that actually push. I'd rather see a high quality tier one in, uh, teacher have more resources in their room than shove kids out of their room. Yep. So like strong co-teaching models or some type of keeping them in with that tier one teacher. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, co-teaching. Yeah, when it's done right. Well, yeah, I hear a lot of people say they don't want to force... Um, pairs together that don't want to be together. And I think the bigger issue is it's trust. So the, the gen ed teacher wants a co-teacher that they can, you know, they believe has some content knowledge and it really just comes down to training, you know, training them together, building a positive team, letting them learn together over time. Yeah. Any last minute questions? There is a link, um, just so you know, in the book, um, not only do we have some online um, website resources, so there's resources in the book, and then there's 
going to be resources available on the Corwin website, but we also have links um, to, to what we consider to be some um, high quality technical scheduling support. So if, if it's a, a weedier technical question that you need support to, there are some uh, resources that we point to um, that can be helpful for some of that. Yes, and Cheryl put that in, and I want to echo that. Thank you to everyone so much for the for the kind words in the chat and for the participation.